over here, you'll see the level. If I wet one finger, there's a line here where I wasn't able to extend over the top of this seat previously, but still the mould is coming back so much quicker. I've been a tenant in this flat here in Newcastle for almost 10 years now. The house or the flat is owned by Newcastle City Council. The council currently are still trying to evict me from this property. This is my main bed and bedroom. This is where I sit when I dress in the morning. I have uh, multiple physical disabilities that make dressing typically or bathing uh, very, very difficult. The pains that I've had in my body for the last 20 plus years, almost 30 years, from arthritis are bad enough. But when it's stress and PTSD on top, everything just spirals out of control completely. When a council landlord wants to evict somebody that they have a duty of care over because the person is disabled or infirmed after operations, they're a, a vulnerable individual. They have an enhanced duty of care over these folk more than they do over uh, normal, well-bodied folk. And I'm thankful of that because it's the only thing that stopped me being evicted when Newcastle City Council keep on insisting that this small room is a uh, bedroom. There is no bed, primarily. There is no direct access to the outside for ventilation. You have to go across an unused room to then get to a second window. I don't believe that this room can be classified as a bedroom because of that. These flats are in a bad state. These are not healthy flats. And I don't feel comfortable or good being in this property. This is not home for me. Any resemblance of that was completely destroyed by Newcastle City Council. Seven Stories is a national centre for children's books. We save, celebrate and share Britain's wonderful and rich literary heritage for children through all sorts of activities. The City Council worked with us and was, was very transparent from quite an early stage that the budgetary cuts would affect its culture budgets. The crux was to, to what extent um, and what we hoped was that, um, that things wouldn't be so severe that they would have to cut us by 100% but what we learned in 2012 as the programme of cuts um, was rolling forward that indeed Newcastle probably would have to cut, our, to cut its culture budget by 100%. So we, we knew at that stage that that was likely to happen, that was, that was confirmed um, in early 20, um, 2012, I think. The challenge that we faced as a council was how can we justify continuing to uh, support uh, arts projects when we're having to uh, close resource centres for older people? And that prompted, I think, a difficult but important conversation about how arts are funded more generally because the subsidy model where arts are entirely re reliant on public sector funding I think just isn't viable in a time of austerity and what we've done in Newcastle is come up with a different solution. We turn over about £10 million a year and we're losing uh, £650,000 a year worth of funding so you know it, it's around 6%. Um, on the one hand 6% isn't an enormous proportion £650,000 is a hell of a lot of money. We've had to uh, reduce our education and learning programme quite significantly, um, uh, as, as, as however valuable that may have been in kind of cultural and educational and social terms, it wasn't bringing any money into the organisation. There was a lot of national chatter around what was happening in Newcastle, but in the city we've worked very closely with arts organisations to come up with really sound, viable alternatives helping organisations like Live Theatre and the Tyneside Cinema to grow their commercial activities so that they're less reliant on public subsidy. The city, in the end, created a fund that was 50% of the former investment and that, that's now being dealt with by the Community Foundation. Um, and, uh, 
also looked at other financial tools that they could help the cultural institutions with. And so Live, with its fourth social enterprise, fourth and largest social enterprise, the city have been a key player in making that happen with a, a prudential borrowing of about six million on a ten and a half million pound project. The Chancellor has clearly laid out that austerity continues for the next five years. But I think the situation that northern local authorities are going to find themselves in is that they won't be able to look after um, children with special needs or the elderly with special needs. Um, and, and I think that's a society that nobody wants of wh whichever uh, political persuasion. <laughs> oh, morale. Well, I would say it was rock bottom, but I mean, it's, it's past rock bottom, there's no morale. Uh, we're all sick of our lives. Most of us are waiting to get up to 55 so we can leave, or if we get paid off, we can access our pensions. It's not the job we joined. We can't deliver the service we want to deliver. We're getting criticised by the public, because you know, at the end of the day, they pay their council tax and they're not getting anything for it, or not getting what they should get, in my view. Uh, we're doing my best, but my best isn't good enough under the service. The cuts are too deep and too quick, uh, and that goes right across the board. There's something in local government that we call the jaws of doom, um, and it's a graph which shows need increasing on one hand and resources declining on the other, and the gap between the two getting wider and wider. And if we continue in the current way, I think public services will become unsustainable. There's a three-year plan, and that three-year plan is a reduction of £40 million in the first year, £30 million in the second year, and £20 million in the third year. Given we've already lost 1,500 jobs, given we've already lost about 72 million, you know, they're going to be very difficult proposals. And for lots of people, there's no alternative. I haven't seen in Newcastle, you know, the private sector grow to provide employment for people who've lost jobs through uh, public services at all. When you make cuts of 40 million pounds, that's a very l huge number. So where will those people go and work? But what we have in here are things like tin tomatoes, fruit, uh, meat, fish, cereals, rice, pasta, tea, coffee, which is a basic selection of essentials that people can make meals from or add to whatever little bits they've got in the cupboard. And at the moment we're feeding a thousand people a week, 500 of those are children under the age of 16. We are quite busy here because we're in an area of back-to-back -back terrace flats. It's the old accommodation left from when the heavy industry was along the river in the shipyards. Most of it is in the hands of private landlords. So it's now what's technically known as private rented accommodation, which is where people who have failed in social housing tend to finish up being rehoused. It's where asylum seekers are housed. It's where Eastern European migrants are housed. So if we're not careful, we finish up creating some sort of a ghetto in this area. And the reason this food bank is so busy is we're right in the middle of it. Almost half are coming as a result of problems with the benefit system. Either they've either been sanctioned or there are delays in changing from one benefit to another. And the average seems to be four to six weeks when people are actually without any money at all because of changes. As part of the benefit reforms, Emergency hardship loans were devolved from Department of Work and Pensions to local government. The calculation that was used was that uh, it was based on the demand in 2005 or 2006. So it was a long way behind. Newcastle City Council were given £150,000 less than they needed to cover crisis loans. So Newcastle City Council reclassified what a crisis was. So a crisis now officially is loss of home through fire or flood, 
others may apply. When I was 18, I had my first son, Leon, um, and I lived in a council flat in Biker, which wasn't an area that I was from. Like, I moved there when I was seven months pregnant, um, and because I was a young parent, she was start, like, sort of came out to reach me and um, introduced me as sort of the teenage pregnancy support group, which I used to go to every week, which is fantastic. The centre that I use is at risk, though we don't know yet whether that centre is going to close. They're obviously doing it to save money, but I think like in the long term, it's going to mean they spend more money because families aren't going to have those preventative services that stop them sort of like falling into trouble in the future. Especially people who don't have families, like young parents who have don't have a supportive family, like they need these services. It's not like an option, like to not have them. The budget that we used to have from central government was 18 million for sure start. Um, that was cut and then cut again and um, in the last year the council has been spending 12 million on sure start. The level of cuts mean that we've got to reduce that to 7.5 million and our approach is therefore to concentrate on the 30% uh, neighbourhoods with greatest deprivation uh, because we think those are the children who are most in need of the support and family help that sure start provides. Nick Forbes plays a very good argument. He says that he's very sorry that he has to cut these services, um, but he's an executioner with a velvet noose. He's very, very sorry that he has to make these cuts, but yet he still makes these cuts anyway. What we want him to do is to support our fight against the cuts and to put up some sort of fight against the cuts. And from the evidence we've seen, he hasn't actually done that. If he's not doing that, then why, what's the purpose of his job? Well, there are some people who say that what we should do is set an illegal budget and go out in a blaze of glory uh, as a kind of grand protest. That's playground politics. We've got to live with the reality of what's happening in Newcastle today. Um, of course the council will set a legally balanced budget every year. My job is to get on to lead the council and the city through difficult times and to make sure that we come out of this period of recession and public sector austerity uh, with our heads held high. Oh, it's David. Okay, David. I come, David, we'll open now. You know if you want to come up. Hello. Okay, we'll open 6 30 for bacon sandwiches, stuff like that. Hello. Okay, we'll see you soon, my friend. Okay? Hello. Take care. There's a route we normally do, but we'll get emails, texts, for check various places because the number of rough sleepers is increasing, so the area is getting bigger that we need to check. But if we find anyone, first and foremost, we'll make sure they're okay. If they're okay, we'll tell them who we are, we'll introduce ourselves, then we'll tell them about the service we can offer, we can get them back to Ronnie House, our idea centre. Then basically we'll try and take accommodation from there. I've been on the streets for about seven, eight months now, and I, I just find it really hard. Nowhere is helping us, I know, like literally the only place that is helping us is Ronnie Gas. Let you, how many times have you found us on the streets now? Numerous times now, yeah, numerous. Hundreds. Exactly, I right. see in spot as well all the time. Yeah. Uh, down under the time bridge. It's, it's not nice, right? Like. Oh. In the past year, half of my friends have killed themselves. Just just because of the crap of what they've been getting on the streets. It's, it's horrible, man. And when you say the crap they've been getting on the streets, what do you mean? Like, hassle, like, people have just been and then like, people are not helping you and just being a really, it just gets to you and you can't take any more and it just ends your life. This is Dean Street Arches, it, it used to be quite a popular spot, particularly in the summer, you know, because it's quite secluded, sheltered and that. What the guy that was sleeping here did, he had the, the boxes as like a coffin shape and he was inside with the sleeping bag just for a little bit extra protection, because as you can see, it's, it's biting wind through here now, so, but we've managed to get him in a condi at it. For the next five years, 
we're going to see 6% reduction in funding and actually our services are going to go up by about 60% and we've got to balance the equilibrium somewhere along the line. The worry that we've got in the future is that schemes such as this and these across the country will be hit hard because councils have no money to do it. But with the amount of cuts that Newcastle's got, it's very difficult for them to do anything. There's going to be no central part of the, uh, central part of the local authority left. And how old are you? 54. Well, I'm basically getting the tune. And that's it. just tell me again how long you've been sleeping out? Since the late 18th, Friday's the late 18th. But we just sleep out all the time. But, but look, that's all we've got. It's f***ing a bunch of people minus four have a feel of that. Yeah, we've got a bit of a problem here. Yeah, it's just about the same as before. Yeah, we've got a bit of a our approach is to make sure that nobody has a second night out and that people who are sleeping rough um, only ever spend one night out in the city and we make sure that we have hostel accommodation available for them uh, to make sure that they are properly looked after. Now, that's going to be increasingly difficult to provide if the cuts continue at the rate that they are.